Dr. Uh, Vanessa Rosier, Director of Research at GESCO in Haiti. Dr. Rosier is Assistant Professor of Medicine at the Wheel Cornell Medicine and Director of Research at GESCO, the largest HIV, AIDS, and TB center in the Caribbean. Her research expertise is, the, is in HIV and hypertension among adolescents. Dr. Rozier is the recipient of the NHLBI diversity supplement to investigate early onset hypertension among adolescents and young adults in Haiti and the Haiti principal investigator of the NIAID um, NIAID funded CCASA net project to evaluate non-communicable diseases among adolescents in the Caribbean and Latin American region. She's also led the scale up of maternal child health and adolescent clinical research at GESCO as the study coordinator and protocol chair from, for, for several NIAID International Maternal Pediatric and Adolescent AIDS Clinical Trials Network. I'm gonna go different side of the world um, to present uh, a smaller scale but similar problem. You're gonna hear a lot about the same issues, the same problems, and the same tools and strategies. So, you know, why are we still talking about 10 million people having TB every year, and uh, why can't we end TB? All right, so the other side of the world, uh, Haiti is a small Caribbean island nation, uh, an hour and a half flight away from uh, South Florida. For those of you who don't know it, uh, population is 11 million inhabitants compared to 150 million uh, Bangladesh, two hours from Florida, as I was saying. But it is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, with the majority of the population that lives on less than a dollar a day. How much was coffee this morning for most of you? <laughs> That's like a meal for a family in some countries in the world. And unfortunately, it's been a very turmoiled and troubled political country because of the political situation in the past four years, and it has severely worsened the situation, and we're really living in unprecedented humanitarian crisis. We've had a negative GDP for the past four years. The inflation is over 50%. If you're complaining about coffee doubling its price, it's uh, imagine food of um, the price of uh, rice and beans. And we're up to 49% of the population that is undernourished. That's very um, high with uh, the recent numbers looking at 4.7 million people that are facing acute hunger. So this is really not a good setup for ending TB uh, in my country. Uh, we have a, a highest incidence of tuberculosis in the Western Hemisphere with 159 new cases per 100,000 inhabitants. And uh, the incidence is very high, but because it's a small country, the absolute numbers are, are smaller, obviously. So that's about 15,000 cases per year uh, with about um, 7,500 missed cases. So, you know... We're, we're missing half of the TB cases around. And the drug-resistant TB rate is up to 3% in Haiti. Haiti, unlike Bangladesh, also has an HIV epidemic problem, which fuels TB incidents, as you know. Uh, we've made significant progress. In the 1990s, uh, the HIV prevalence in the general population was close to 8% in Haiti. But we've uh, made uh, significant progress, turned the tide around, with significant international support, namely the PEPFAR and Global Fund programs. And it's now less than 2% of the general population, but it's still a major driver of the TB epidemic. And 27% of uh, newly diagnosed uh, TB cases are HIV co-infected, which obviously makes uh, the morbidity, the mortality higher, but also treatment uh, more complicated. So TB stands as the, as the fifth leading cause of death in Haiti. So just to show you uh, this tiny little country in the whole Western Hemisphere really is driving um, the incidence um, of tuberculosis in the region. So even though it doesn't make the WHO high burden country um, list because of the absolute numbers, 
it's still a country that has a significant problem and it's leading by far. So uh, the next country up after Haiti in terms of incidents is Peru. And Brazil also has a high problem with tuberculosis because of the, uh, the large population, but the incidence is much higher. So Haiti has more than double the incidence rate of other large countries in the area. So the funny name, I work at the institution called Jeskio Centers because uh, the word uh, AIDS had not been coined yet when this was founded in 1982 and the virus that causes um, AIDS had not been identified. So it's a French acronym for the Haitian group of the study of Kaposi sarcoma and opportunistic infections. For those of you who were around back in the days, um, it started with um, um, my, um, the founding um, doctor at Jaskio, Dr. Bill Pop, who was actually working with uh, diarrhea in children, and they would bring him these adults who were emaciated with chronic diarrhea and had Kaposi sarcoma, and turned out to be the first uh, AIDS patients in Haiti. That was in 1980, 1981, just around the time that the first um, notifications came out of San Francisco for what was initially called the um, uh, gay-associated um, immune deficiency. So JESCIO is really a testament to a very old institution that is uh, fighting against HIV. The mission is tripartite. It's to address public health issues that are relevant to the Haitian population, looking at translational research models that are aimed at scaling up public health models, Really, the idea is to improve the health of all in Haiti. Uh, it's also a training center. It's the largest postgraduate training center in Haiti. We, is, we have various training modules from um, uh, laboratory technicians to nurse practitioners to physicians, and uh, they are um, disseminated across the country. And we're also a very large clinical care center with both infectious and non-communicable disease focus and uh, because we're old, uh, we also are the, one of the largest HIV and TB centers in the Americas. The aim is really to provide one-stop clinical care for patients, so a comprehensive model of care. Uh, people are so poor, they can't afford to be going <laughs> to various levels for their basic health needs. So we are very creative <laughs> in trying to provide everything in a one-stop shop. Uh, we provide clinical care uh, across the spectrum, pregnant mothers, newborns, all the way to 100 years old, if you're lucky to make it that far. We also have a primary school that is uh, funded by the Prince Albert of Monaco because children in the community also need to go to school. We have a vocational training center. A lot of our women with HIV who were uh, sex workers wanted to get out of the trade, if you will, so we have um, engagement programs and training programs for them. And uh, we provide economic opportunities, small business loans uh, for people as well. Importantly, we're a technical partner of the Ministry of Health because whatever uh, models and lessons we find need to be scaled up if we want to have a national impact. And we work also with multiple partners, both locally and internationally, including the Fondation Milieu. And uh, as a research center, it's important, and we tap into the very generous NIH, and we've had continuous NIH support for uh, research since 1983. Um, we have, uh, I will brag, the best TB lab in the Caribbean, supported by the Fondation Milieu. Uh, we're also part of the Gabriel Network. It's the only TB reference lab in the Caribbean that is accredited by an international institution. And it also serves as a reference lab for HIV. We do about 40% of the viral loads for the country as well. It's a busy place. Um, so JESCIO, as being a reference center, happens to be the largest institution diagnosing uh, TB cases in the country. And this has been consistent over the past, I'm just showing the past five years. But we're by far, uh, I don't know if this, uh, I should have figured it out. Is the anyways, um, we you know the we diagnosed uh, the next TB center diagnoses half as many cases as we do. So 
just to show that um, we see a lot of TB at Jeskio. So I'm just gonna share with you um, strategies to improve case detection. Uh, we had uh, TB reach funding uh, for active case finding in the communities. That was conducted in 2014 to 2015 in urban slums of Port-au-Prince. Port-au-Prince is a very uh, small city. So all of Haiti is 27,000 kilometers square. And Port-au-Prince, so 11 million people in the country, uh, 3.5 million are in this very crowded um, uh, urban area. And when we talk about slums in Haiti, it's really densely populated um, living quarters, very poor sanitary conditions, which is ripe for TB transmission, basically. You typically will have 10 people sleeping in a one room uh, at night. So if you can imagine, if you have one uh, index case in there, it does not take much for TB to spread. So the idea is really, as uh, was described by the presenters earlier, uh, TB is there, and we don't want to be waiting for people to be coming into the health centers. We need to go get them. Ideally, you can identify them early on before all 10 other people in the room um, get infected with tuberculosis. So those nine urban slums, it's a very packed, dense area just across from Jaskio. It's not even um, a 10-mile radius. It's about 130,000 um, inhabitants. And this was done uh, a few years after the major earthquake that we had in Haiti in 2010. As I told you, the population in Port-au-Prince is 3.5 million. After the earthquake, we had 1.5 million people who were homeless because their houses were destroyed. So they were in tent cities. Another great uh, festering uh, scenario for TB transmission. So this was still four years after the earthquake and we still had about 300,000 people in close proximity living in tent cities. So we extended to the slums and to the tent cities, the active case finding. And as was previously described, you just train community healthcare workers, you pick people that are known in the areas and you send them out with a simple questionnaire. Are you, have you been coughing for more than two weeks? And uh, if they are, have been, you do a little education and they accompany them to a referral center to get screened and evaluated. So they would ask a few more questions, but anybody who had cough greater uh, than two weeks was referred for evaluation uh, to be seen by a doctor for a, a nurse uh, for a physical exam, chest x-ray, and then smear microscopy and expert. So I'll just take you through over 104,000 people uh, were contacted door to door in those slums in those tent cities. 104 were screened, uh, 7,000 uh, reported cough, um, and uh, 6,000 were referred to be evaluated at JASCIO. And of those 5,598 that presented, they were tested for TB, and 1,000 were diagnosed with tuberculosis. Just to show you that um, that's 1,000 people who were just hanging out at home, not seeking care, who had um, active tuberculosis. So it's really a cost-effective, simple strategy that um, should be implemented instead of waiting for people to, to show up. So that's a TB prevalent uh, incidence of a thousand over a hundred thousand. That's like four times the national average at the time. So just to show you that it's really uh, beneficial to go looking for people for with TB instead of waiting for them to, to show up. The methods for TB diagnosis, um, we uh, were fortunate that we had both chest x-ray, so symptom screen obviously, and then chest x-ray and sputum testing. Uh, I'm just showing you the results in the adults. Dr. Banu clearly um, showed us it's more difficult to diagnose in children. I'm not presenting that data. And basically, it was at the time where gene expert was being rolled out. So this is the first generation expert, not the ultra. And um, it was able to, in HIV negative individuals, we were able to have 92% confirmation of tuberculosis. And in HIV infected participants, it was less, but 80% bacteriologically confirmed. 
expert had a detection rate of people who are symptomatic at 80 percent and 20 percent were only uh, started on TB treatment based on clinical or radiological um, findings. So this was a very uh, productive effort, a one-year effort. Uh, more cases of tuberculosis were diagnosed through this active case finding project than 260 other clinics in the country. So, and this was in a very small, restricted geographic area. But it also yielded um, positive results for HIV as well, because everybody who was screened was also tested for HIV. And we were able to identify 10% of people with HIV compared to the less than 2% general prevalence population, just to show that you can combine interventions and, and make it um, more uh, cost effective. Jesco had done some previous active case finding campaigns uh, prior to GeneXpert being rolled out, and it was similarly effective. It was one in 2011, right after the earthquake, where we had a um, refugee camp basically on the grounds, on the property of Jesco. People across the street just moved in with us and stayed for about a year. Uh, we screened 10,000 people, and we identified um, 267 TB cases who were our neighbors, right? These were people who were living on the grounds where you park your car, you know? Um, and then in 2013, when people would go back into the slums, uh, we also went in with the community and uh, there was just a lot of TB to be found. So um, really just saying that uh, it's fruitful. However, it's not perfect. It's not easy necessarily. There are certainly challenges and barriers. Um, uh, whatever gains we had can quickly be lost when uh, politics don't go in your favor and healthcare systems are totally um, threatened. Uh, so certainly rising poverty, food insecurity, uh, as you know, TB is a disease of poverty, high migration because of high gang violence in neighborhoods. Uh, you identified someone who is symptomatic and they don't show up for TB testing, they don't get treated or they move. And we've had a lot of health centers that have had to close because of the gang violence. There's been limited funding of the National TB Program, which um, kind of limits the cumulative successes that you can have over time. And then uh, these active case findings were linked to referral to uh, larger health centers. We need to have better systems for rural areas as well. And I'm not presenting, but pediatric and pregnant women algorithms are not as productive, even when you do active case finding. And we need to have better solutions for pregnant women and children. And then we need better community engagement, because there's still a lot of stigma. And it's really challenging. If we don't onboard the community, we're not going to end TB. Just a couple of pictures. I say these words, but just to show you the gang violence and uh, the trouble going on back home. So what are the potential strategies to end TB, not only in Haiti? Haiti is a very small country. It certainly could be a pilot uh, demonstration project to show that we can do this. We certainly have the tools. We certainly need the political will uh, and the international support to do so. We could certainly focus active case findings in urban and rural hotspots integrate mobile uh, chest x-ray clinics with uh, artificial intelligence, with the softwares that give you a readout. Uh, Expert has been rolled out, but then it's not funded, and then you don't have cartridges, or the machines are not maintained. And then how do you combine that with TB preventative therapy for high-risk groups, so either household contacts or persons living with HIV? And then how do we really get people to bring on board, especially when we have weak healthcare infrastructures, how do we leverage the community to do what needs to be done for the last mile? All right, I'll just end with um, TB is a disease of poverty, and we should not take for granted the successes that we make that can be quickly undermined um, when chaos ensues. All right, thank you.